Greetings, Waitara Anglican Church. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Penny Carpentier, and I used to attend the 5pm service there at Waitara. But at the moment, I'm in Namibia, serving as a missionary with SIM. I'm working as a lecturer at the Namibia Evangelical Theological Seminary, or NETS, here in Windhoek, the capital. Now, I don't know about you guys, but at the moment, I'm just really tired. For me, it's the end of semester, but for you guys, maybe it's because you work with a lot of people or you have kids and you just have all these demands coming at you from every direction. And sometimes, you know, you're just done. We really need a rest just to recharge our batteries. And that's where we actually find Jesus at the start of our passage of scripture today. So far, we've been following Jesus in the early part of his ministry as he's been zooming across the Galilean countryside. Well, not zooming as in having lots of internet video conferences, but, you know, racing across the Galilean countryside. And he's been healing and driving out demons and preaching about the good news of the kingdom of God and generally just giving a lot of himself. But Jesus also knows that rest is important, and so that's why he's headed off to a completely different region to be able to recharge. And he's headed to the region of Tyre. Now, Tyre was a major trading city, and it was the capital of the Roman province of Syria, which was just to the north of Galilee, which is where Jesus was. Galilee itself was known as Galilee of the Gentiles, which we read about in Matthew chapter 4, verse 15. But Syria, this was proper Gentile territory. Gentile, of course, means non-Jewish. And the lady that Jesus meets here is described as a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia, so sort of the coastal region of that province of Syria. So she is a very Gentile lady in a very Gentile part of the world. In fact, it might seem a little odd to us that Jesus and this woman even cross paths, but this is what we read in Mark chapter 3, verse 8. When they heard all all about what he was doing, many people came to him, that's Jesus, from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, which is the region towards the south of Jerusalem, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. So Jesus was already famous in more than just his hometown. So this was the perfect opportunity for this woman to free her daughter from the clutches of this evil power, that this man who was famous for his healing and driving out of demons, his power was coming into her region. But it's important for us to note here that this isn't an exorcism story. Yes, a demon does get cast out, but that's not the point of the story here. See, usually you can put these miracle and teaching accounts of Jesus into basically three categories. Either they teach us something about Jesus, something about God's kingdom, and or, because sometimes they can teach us more than two things, or they can teach us something about kingdom people people who are in the kingdom of God, what they should be like. So, for example, if we were looking at an exorcism story where Jesus casts out a demon, that will tell us usually something about Jesus, that he has supreme spiritual power. But that's not what today's narrative is about. Today's passage tells us what God's kingdom is like and what God's kingdom people should be like as well. And to understand this, we need to actually go back to the beginning of chapter 7. If you have your Bibles open there already, then just scroll up a bit from our reading this morning, or this afternoon, or this evening, whenever you're watching. Scroll up to the beginning of the chapter, or open your Bible up again to Mark chapter 7 and verse 1. This is just before today's reading to give some context. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing 
holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions such as the washing of cups, pitchers, that is like jugs, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their foods with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honour your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, slander, evil, sorry, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. So in this discussion about ceremonial cleanness and uncleanness that Jesus is having with the Pharisees, Jesus' emphasis is, as it will be time and again throughout the Gospels, that it's the heart attitude that counts, not what you do on the outside, how good you are at following religious rules or looking religious. And this becomes particularly important when it comes to Gentiles. See, for the Jews of Jesus' day, Gentiles were naturally unclean. They weren't part of God's people. They didn't go to the temple and um, have sacrifices there for their sins or for any other reason. They didn't do the ceremonial washing that the Pharisees were urging everyone to do. If Jews, if Gentiles rather, if Gentiles wanted to come close to God, they wanted to worship God, then they had to become Jews first. So what does that mean, this idea of cleanness and uncleanness not really mattering, but that it's the heart attitude that counts? What does this mean for Gentiles? Well, let's look in more detail at this brief theological debate between Jesus and the woman that we have from today's passage. Come with me back down to verses 27 and 28. Now, this is just after the woman has come to Jesus asking him for help. First, let the children eat all they want, Jesus told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Sir, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Well, now these two are being very poetic and philosophical, and we'll come to what they mean in a little bit. But at first glance here, it seems that Jesus is reluctant to heal this woman's daughter. Well, why would Jesus be reluctant to heal someone? It's because, like I said before, this is not an exorcism story. Jesus isn't actually reluctant. This instead is a teaching moment. To tell you what I mean, to explain what I mean, let me ask you, have you ever heard of a Dorothy Dixer? 
for those of you who are not familiar, which is probably most people, I wasn't until recently, this is the name that's given to a certain type of question in Australian politics, named after an American advice columnist named Dorothy Dix. Her column was syndicated worldwide and that's how she came to be known in Australia. What she found was that the questions that people would write into her asking for advice were too boring. So she thought, what I'm going to do is ask myself my own questions. So in that way, she should she could give out the advice that she really wanted to give to people that she thought everyone should hear. Now, this idea made its way into Australian politics, where one member of parliament would ask a prearranged question to another member of their own party in parliament. And in that way, they could say what they both wanted to say that they thought the public needed to hear. Something like, I would like to ask the minister why his policy is so awesome. And the minister would say, I thank my friend for his very insightful and important question. My policy is important and awesome because blah, blah, blah. In that way, both of them worked together to make the point they thought needed to be made. If you wanted to think of it in sporting terms, it's like a layup for a slam dunk in basketball or in football, a winger's cross into the path of the striker to score a goal or in volleyball, a set for your teammates spike to hopefully score a point. So Jesus isn't in fact reluctant to heal this woman's daughter to free her from this demon. He's asking her a Dorothy Dixer. He's setting her up to make the point that he knows she'll make, that both of them agree with, and that the disciples and us really need to hear. See, he sets her up with the popular Jewish idea that probably his disciples also held, that the Messiah was king only for the Jews, that he would save only the Jews, that is the children in this story, and that the dogs, that is the Gentiles, would have no part in this kingdom. Well, they couldn't. According to Jewish thinking at the time, Gentiles couldn't be part of that kingdom because of their natural uncleanness. But the woman counters with the truth slam dunk. Even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Now that's cool, but we're probably going to have to break it down into more boring terms so we understand what she's talking about. The dogs that Jesus and the woman are talking about here aren't street dogs, they aren't working dogs, they're pet dogs, family dogs, house dogs, lap dogs. The dogs that are part of your family, part of your household. And as such, they eat the same food. From the parents to the smallest children to the dogs vacuum cleaning up the crumbs afterwards, they all share in the same food. So what she's saying here is that, yes, she understands that Jesus' ministry is first to the Gentiles, but that will not be where his ministry ends. It can't be where his ministry ends. At that moment, Gentiles like her only got tiny little bits from Jesus. One person healed here and someone delivered from demons there. But God's kingdom will inevitably open to everyone, Gentiles as well as Jews. In fact, we see this in the verses at just the beginning of our passage today. Jesus comes to the Gentile region but he is not able to be kept hidden. The fact is that salvation is not a matter of what you do. It's not a matter of what people group you're from. It's a matter of the heart attitude, like I said. Specifically, it's a matter of faith in Christ Jesus. And that's a truth that breaks every boundary that we like to put up, like the cleanness, uncleanness attitude. All the way through Mark, we read about how Jesus is honouring the faith of people who come to put their trust in him. Whether it's people letting their friend through a hole in the roof, or the woman who secretly touches Jesus' clothes, or 
a beggar sitting by the side of the road or this woman in our passage today. It's our faith that matters. This woman knows that God's salvation is for all people and her coming to Jesus shows that she knows who that salvation comes through. Matthew, in his account of this event, makes it even more clear. He says this in Matthew 15, verse 28. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. See, this is a message of hope because it tells us that the kingdom of God is open to everyone. Now, I'm a Gentile. I'm not a Jew. And so the fact that his kingdom is open to people like me is amazing. And I praise God for it. And this is a point that Jesus himself has been making since way back in chapter 2 of Mark. So look, if you're someone who thinks that they can't come to Jesus for whatever reason, for because you think you don't, you're not the right sort of person, you look at people in church and think, man, I would not fit in there. If you think that, then this passage is for you. God's kingdom is full of people who shouldn't be there. He breaks any human boundaries or restrictions because his love has no boundaries or restrictions. It doesn't matter what you've done, what you used to believe, how you've been brought up, where you're from, who you are, where your life has led you. Jesus doesn't care. He wants to have a friendship personally with you. He wants to heal the broken relationship that you've had with God. He wants to join you wherever you are now, whoever you are now, and lead you into an amazing new future. If you want, that's an invitation that is open for you to take hold of. But remember, this is not a private discussion between Jesus and this woman. Jesus plays out this whole interaction for his disciples, almost like a living parable to illustrate the point that he was making to the Pharisees beforehand. So what should their response, and the response of all Jesus' followers, be to this teaching that he's making? Well, let me give you a negative example first. We were looking at this idea in one of my synoptic gospel classes, this idea that Jesus opens up his kingdom to everyone, including people who are usually on the fringes of society. So in Jesus' time, there were tax collectors, Jewish people who didn't follow Jewish law, and Gentiles, as we saw today. And so I asked them the question, what people do you think are in today's society, in our society in Namibia, that would fit into this sort of category. And we came up with a list like sand people, the sand are a very downtrodden tribe here, uh, sex workers, poor people, disabled people, and so on. Then one of my students said, look, I agree very much that these people should hear the gospel. I think they don't usually hear it and they really need to, but I don't think they should go to church. And I was like, well, why not? Churches are where Christians hang out together. Well, he said, because churches are so judgmental that if anyone even looked like they were one of these sorts of people, then they would be shunned by the church members. Just completely rejected. I was like, wow, that is so telling and so disappointing. The people who are supposed to be reflecting what Jesus is like can act like that. And that is actually not just a problem in Namibia, but I, I myself have been shunned by people in Australian churches just because of what I look like or what I dress or what I happen to be doing at the time. So how should we respond? Let me suggest two attitudes that we should have. Firstly, don't be judgmental, but be hospitable. Secondly, don't be fearful, but be interested. So 
don't be judgmental, but be hospitable. And don't be fearful, but be interested. Firstly, let's not be judgmental, but instead hospitable. Being judgmental involves simply looking at someone, what they're wearing, what nationality they seem to be, what behaviours they happen to be doing, whatever, and then automatically thinking negatively of them. You don't even know who they are, but you just look at them and think they're bad people. And this can even turn into a habit, a reflex that you automatically dismiss and reject people who aren't like you, who are different. And this can be either just individually or even a whole group. It can become like this unwritten rule that only people who fit this certain mould are welcome. Like sure, other people might be allowed to attend, but they're not welcomed into the community. This is not what Jesus is like. He never dismissed someone because they were from a different part of society or from a different culture group or even from a different gender. We're all different in so many ways. and Those differences aren't right or wrong. They're just different. And what makes us special? So, instead of being negative and judgmental, we should be hospitable. Now, hospitality isn't simply having someone over to your house for dinner or baking a cake or something like that. Hospitality is an attitude that works itself out in some very awesome actions. It's an attitude of openness to the different. So hospitality is openness to the different. It means that you create a safe space for someone to be themselves because it's fine for them to be themselves. And you can do this in many different ways, in small ways like being genuinely friendly when you greet someone new or when you greet someone that you haven't greeted before. Or introducing that new or person you haven't talked to to your friends or inviting them to an event or inviting them into your own home in big and small ways. And it means also not just saying hello one week and then thinking of it like, yes, I ticked my hospitality box and so I don't need to talk to that person ever again. It's about building relationship, having that open heart for the different and getting to actually know someone. That's the opposite of judgmentalism that refuses to know that person and just, you know, judging them. And this brings us to our next point. Don't be afraid, but be interested. Often judgmentalism comes from a place of fear. Difference could be a threat somehow, that fear of the unknown, that it could be dangerous. Or perhaps maybe you're just socially awkward like me and you find people, especially new people, a bit scary. But we have to remember what John says in 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. Love for our neighbour, which is at the heart of this concept of inclusion that Jesus was teaching, puts our neighbour first. So rather than being afraid of this person, putting our fears or our preferences first, we're putting them first. We're being actually actively interested in what that person is discussing, what they're saying. Find out who this person is. Where are they from? What brings them here? What's their story? Focusing on that other person and what they're sharing takes the pressure off you and helps you to open your heart to them. And the more you try, the more you practice, the easier and less awkward it gets. Trust me. Now, I realize as I'm saying this, church isn't actually open. So how can you welcome someone to somewhere that is closed? Well, now is the time to be preparing yourself. A lot of our talks on the book of Mark so far have been urging people to put their faith in Christ, 
That is one of the aims of these Gospels. And so if you're one of the people out there who was thinking about becoming a Christian and you're not one yet, then totally do it. Talk to a Christian that you know. Talk to someone at the church. Our contact details are here on the website. But yeah, do it. And you know that when church opens and you decide to come to church, everyone's going to be welcoming to you because I just told them they should be. Now, for Christians, though, we need to think about how we can practice being hospitable, how we can practice being open to the different in the meantime. If you are already part of another group that is open, so maybe a sporting interest group or a craft group or a parents group or something like that, think about how you can practice being hospitable, inclusive and interested and open. So whether it's towards new people, all those people who are on the outer fringes of the group who it doesn't seem like they're well part of the community. Secondly, as soon as this video ends, before you scroll down to prayers or whatever it is next, then go to your calendar, analog, digital, whatever, and put in a recurring reminder every Saturday, every Sunday, rather, every Sunday, be hospitable. And put in two entries below. How can I be hospitable and not judgmental? How can I be interested and not fearful? And fill in those with ways that you think you can be welcoming to other people. You know how you interact with people. You know what your strengths are. So think about ways that you could do that immediately after the video, I tell you. So that way, when church does reopen, you're already prepared. You're already ready to be welcoming. See, just as Jesus opened his kingdom to all of us, despite, because, with our differences, no matter who we are, Jesus opens his kingdom to us, and so we should also open our hearts and our churches to everyone.